All right, here we are, Genesis uh, lesson number 21. Um, for those of you who are following along in your own Bibles and not watching on the, uh, on the screen, uh, you would open your Bibles to Genesis chapter six. That's where we're at, Genesis chapter six. As I do every week, uh, we, um, we kind of do a little review, kind of compress some of the information that we've had so far. So in our last lesson, we reviewed the millennium between Adam and Noah. So you think I'm going slow because I'm just doing a few verses, but we actually covered a millennium of time when we talked about the, uh, the material in Genesis. And so uh, what we did is uh, there was an end to Adam's record. Remember I said the, the patriarchs, the various uh, characters in, the, uh, in, in that pre-Diluvian, pre-flood time, uh, are keeping track, are writing, if you wish. And so there is the end of Adam's record of his own generations, that's Genesis 5.1. So up to Genesis 5.1 you have Adam writing and, and describing what's going on, and then the beginning of Noah's record in Genesis 5 verse 2. Uh, Noah summarizes Adam's life, so you start in, ch in chapter 5, and just like any other writer, he summarizes what happened before, a couple of verses, and then he moves ahead, and uh, he uh, links, if you wish, together the ten patriarchs through whom the original promise of God was carried from generation to generation. So we reviewed these last time looking at their ages. Remember we went through the ages, so-and-so lived for 500 years, so-and-so lived for 900 years. You know? Well, what uh, Noah is doing is he's tracing the generations of the patriarchs through that, through that millennium, all right? And I also said to you, you know, there's a couple of ideas here that you need to keep in mind. One of them is that the Bible does not focus on social development or history per se. I mean, there's history there, but it has not been written to give us the history of man, all right? It has been written to give us the history of how God's promise to man was fulfilled throughout the ages. So there's history happening and nations are rising and falling, inventions are being made, uh, cities uh, and countries are at war with each other and all that stuff is going on and archeologists and historians you know, are discovering this and writing about this. The Bible is not interested in that necessarily. It's interested in, in kind of um, giving us the thread of the promise of a savior made to Adam and how that promise was fulfilled throughout history. And so it just names major characters along the way, you know, guy, like relay, if you want like a relay, you know, one handed off the promise to another, and then that one did a time and handed off the promise to another. And the Bible only follows that particular line. And once in a while it gives information about what's going on in that society at that particular time, only as a way of kind of you know, giving some background to the story that it's telling. But the main story that it's telling is how did the promise, uh, how was it fulfilled from generation to generation, from Adam all the way to the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, the other thing I reminded you of is when you're reading Genesis, remember, uh, think of a movie, you know, think of camera angles. There's the close-up shot, then there's the wide shot, and then there's subplots. So you've got the close-up when, when uh, the, the writers are talking about a particular character and they're giving a lot of detail about that character. And then there's the wide shot where the Bible is giving like you know, 10 patriarchs over a, a millennium. You know, that's like a wide shot. And then you've got subplots. The one subplot is um, uh, how the promise was given uh, and, and maintained from generation to generation, okay? The seed of promise. And then there's another subplot, and that's the constant war between the children of the seed of promise and the children of Satan, okay? So the Bible doesn't give you any uh, stage information. It doesn't say, okay, and now we're going to switch to a wide shot, and now we're going to, you have to kind of know that that's what's going on. And if you do, it, it makes it a little bit less uh, confusing. So tonight, we're going to go from a wide shot of the seed of promise over the span of a thousand years to a close-up view of one single man 
through whom that promise was preserved during the worst calamity the earth has or will ever suffer until the end of time. The worst calamity that the earth has ever suffered until the end of time when the, when the heavens and the earth will be destroyed happened at the flood. Yeah, there are bad things happening, volcanoes, mudslides, so on and so forth, but none of these modern things comes even close to the catastrophe that was visited upon the earth with the great flood. So let's go to uh, Noah here. Um, I'm not going to read out of Genesis, I'm reading a passage out of Matthew here, verse 24, or chapter 24, verses 37-39, and I'll tell you why I'm reading this. So let's just read that, Matthew 24. Jesus is the one who's speaking. He says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, there are a lot of people who believe that Jesus you know, is the Son of God, they believe that He's the Messiah, and they believe that His word is contained in the New Testament. But many times, these very same people doubt the historicity of the global flood. In other words, they believe Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't really believe in the flood. Oh, that's just a myth, you know, that's just a thing, you know, that's just mythology, that's just mythology. And the reason I read this particular passage here is that the New Testament records that Jesus not only referred to the flood as an accurate historical fact, but He urged His disciples to study it in order to be prepared for His own coming in the future. So don't say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and He's the Messiah, and His word you know, is God's word. Don't say that, and then in the same breath say, but the flood, that's just a myth, that's just an ancient thing, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's not really true. Because if you say that, you're saying, well, the Son of God, He said it was true. The, inspirer, the inspired writers quoting Jesus, they said that He said this was a true thing. And Noah was not a mythological, mythological character, he was a real person, and this flood was a true historical uh, catastrophe. And so um, I, I, you know, I can't be there you know, at the time of the flood, none of us can. Uh, we don't have any pictures of the event. Isn't that amazing? Nowadays, you know, if you don't have a picture of it, you know, somebody that hasn't gotten it on their cell phone or something like that, we don't think it's true. So we don't have any pictures, but I do have an eyewitness, that's Noah who wrote about it, and I have his words confirmed by Jesus, who's the Son of God. So for me, this is enough to convince me that when we speak of Noah and the flood, we're talking about an accurate account of an historical event. I believe it, why? Not only because the Bible says so, but even in the Bible, Jesus Himself refers to the flood, okay? All right, so now let's switch back to Genesis 6, uh, uh, one to four. Uh, it says, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were, uh, who were of old, men of renown. This passage, oh man, this passage. <laughs> Lots been said about this particular, this particular passage. A lot of, um, um, uh, this is a very controversial passage and it can be interpreted in several ways. So let's do that. Let's look at the main interpretations that have been given to this passage. Interpretation number one is that angels took women as wives and produced children and these children were like the seed of Satan, okay? 
I actually read a book a little while back just about angels. It was just angels, a long book of nearly 400 pages. Nothing. It had only one topic and that was angels. And in this particular book, this, uh, the writer uh, believed that this was the accurate um, interpretation of this passage. His point was fallen angels uh, in the service of Satan uh, with the purpose of destroying mankind, uh, with the purpose of sowing wickedness on earth, took women as human women, uh, well, there's only one kind of woman, is human one. <laughs> there are a lot of jokes there, but we won't make them, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and so they, they, uh, they uh, uh, became, uh, they took them as wives. In other words, they became intimate with them and, and bore children, you know? Um, um, so there's lots to say for this, uh, for this particular interpretation. Uh, the term sons of God uh, that uh, is written in, jo in, um, in um, Genesis, that term when it's used always referred to, the, to angels in the Old Testament and uh, was translated this way in the Septuagint and Josephus and a lot of early uh, church uh, writers. I don't know if I've got it here. Uh, in Jude, for example, verse six in the New Testament, Jude writes about this, he says, and angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And so some people think that that passage there in Jude 6, you know, they didn't keep their place in the spirit world, they left their place in the spirit world, they went to earth and so on and so forth. They believe that Jude 6 somehow is coupled with Genesis, uh, you know, that the, these are comparative passages. Uh, I, I'm not telling you this is what it is, I'm just telling you this is one interpretation and this is the reason why people come to this particular conclusion. Angels took women as wives to produce evil seed. Okay, another uh, interpretation is that the descendants of Seth, who was a righteous man, we know that Seth was a righteous man, sons of God, righteous men, began to marry the descendants of Cain, who were unrighteous. And these unions between believers and unbelievers produced wicked offspring. In other words, it began to dilute the righteousness of the line of Seth, and thereby corrupted the population of that time. Another interpretation is that demonic forces possessed the descendants of Cain and these individuals took women and produced equally possessed children who were powerfully wicked. I mean, I, I try to think of some other way that you could, you know, some other conclusion, but these are pretty much the three main ideas if you go through uh, you know, commentaries and other writers and scholars, there are only three things. Uh, if you're waiting for me to jump on one of them, I'm not going to do it, because they all have something you know, to offer. But I will tell you one thing. Whichever interpretation you use, you end up at the same place. You end up at the same place. Super powerful and wicked beings began to inhabit the earth and raise the level of evil and violence to intolerable levels. The Nephilim that they're talking about, they were giants, just like uh, uh, Goliath you know, from Gath was from a family of giants. Well, the Nephilim in Hebrew talks about individuals who were giants at these times. So these verses here are given to explain how these people came, how did we get such powerfully wicked people? Well, these verses here are there to explain that. These people, the other thing about this verse is that these wicked, powerful people were lionized uh, by the population of that time in ungodly songs and fables and myths and so on and so forth. So just like you know, we, uh, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, we all know Bonnie and Clyde, you know, the, 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 the Depression era bank robbers, you know, a husband and wife team of bank robbers. And what were they? They were bank robbers, they were thieves, they were murderers, they were you know, criminals. 
You know, what's so surprising that a woman can be a criminal? You know, women and men can be criminals. And what did they do? They robbed banks, they shot people, they killed people, they tried to evade the law. But what did the media do with them? Well, they, 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 they lionized them, they, the myth about Bonnie and Clyde, you know, and so on and so forth. Even during their own lifetime, you know, the idea, oh, they're stealing from the rich banks and they're giving to the poor. No, they weren't. They were, they were bank robbing for themselves. They weren't starting a social service program. You know, it wasn't a benevolence program. And then give it another 40 or 50 years and what does Hollywood do? Well, Hollywood goes back and you know, resurrects this and who do you get? You get, uh, what's his name, the actor Warren Beatty and another lovely looking uh, actress and they portray. If you ever seen an actual picture of Bonnie and Clyde? Not the best looking people. <laughs> Not the best looking. Good thing it was the era of radio. If you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? Because if there would have been TV in those days, you know, they, they wouldn't have been heroes. You know? Ugly people can't be heroes. It's just sad. You know, you know how that is. You know? So, Thank you. you're welcome. I won't tell your name, so your name is not on record. Steve House. But uh, <laughs> anyways, so I, I'm just trying to give you the idea here that the very same impetus is happening here. Wicked people you know, doing wicked things in society and being held up as, wow, these guys are like superheroes, you know, they're giants and so on and so forth in songs and so on and so forth. So this passage is explaining how wicked society is. It, at this time, society is actually applauding the wickedness in its, in its midst. A little bit like today, don't you think? Aren't we applauding and we, we give trophies and awards to people you know, who are sinful you know, and lewd and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so what's happening in this passage is that God is declaring that there's going to be a judgment. He's saying this is what's happening, these bad people are doing it, society is lionizing these people, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to take it. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I'm not going to take it anymore. You've got 120 years, imagine, we usually say, I'll give you a, a I'll count to three. You know. God says, I'll give you 120 years to kind of turn it, to turn it around. So we read the next passage, five and six says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So there's the conclusion. He looks at man, he sees what's going on, and he realizes these people are hopeless. Because if every intention of the heart is evil for everyone, what's going to happen to that society? Well, they're going to implode. They're just going to end up killing each other, that's all. You know, if it's the law of survival, you know, survival of the fittest, well, eventually most of the people are going to be dead. They're going to kill each other kill each other off. So Noah summarizes the condition of the world, which is complete anarchy. Wickedness is everywhere. People's thinking and plans are always evil. There's no restraining power. There's no mitigation power. There's nothing. So God does not repent. You know, it says God repents. God doesn't repent of sin, because you know, there's no sin in God. He, he changes His attitude. That's what repentance is, isn't it? When I repent, I change my attitude. Before, you know, I, I, I would sin and it wouldn't bother me and I would even look for occasions to sin. If I repent, what I'm doing is I'm changing my mind about sin. I can't get rid of it altogether, I can't be perfect, but I can change my mind about sin. I no longer want to sin. I actually want to do what's right, even though sometimes I, I don't do it for whatever reason. You know. But in my heart, God knows that I, I want to do the right thing. That's repentance. Well, in the same way, God's attitude was love and mercy towards a race that may, may have been imperfect, but was attempting to serve Him. That attitude changes, repents, to one of judgment and righteous indignation when that race dissolves into complete wickedness and rebellion. So he changes his attitude. My attitude was mercy, was patience, so on and so forth. Now my attitude has changed. Now my attitude is there's going to be a judgment because you're not paying attention, you're not listening to me, and so on and so forth. Now, different 
passages throughout the Bible give us a more detailed view of the condition of the antediluvian, that means before the flood, the antediluvian world that led to its destruction. We only get this little bit in Genesis, but there are other places that talk about this time. Let me give you a couple of them. Uh, one of them talks about the preoccupation with physical appetites at that time. Luke uh, chapter seven, it says, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it'll be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Someone will say, well, what's wrong with eating and drinking? What's wrong with being married? What's wrong with having weddings and so on and so forth? There's nothing wrong with them, but this is the only thing that's going on. There's no worship of God, there's no service, there's, no, you know, there's just materialism. Okay? Uh, in another uh, passage, in Genesis 6-2, it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. So there was satanic activity in the physical realm. That was also taking place at that time. Another passage, uh, in Hebrews 11 verse seven, it says, by faith Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So there was general disbelief. Notice, you know, only one man and one family is told what is going to actually take place. So an, a, a time of general disbelief. Uh, ungodly behavior, Jude, verse 14 and 15, it says, uh, it was also about these men that Enoch, Enoch is one of those 10 patriarchs in the first millennium before the flood, right? So it says, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, behold, the Lord came with thousands of His holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. This is Enoch, he's a prophet. He's talking about what's going on during the period before the flood and he's warning people saying, God is going to punish you for what is going on here, okay? And then uh, one more, this place in Genesis chapter six, verse 11, it says, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them and behold, I am about to destroy them um, with the earth. So just showing you a, a few other passages that talks about this particular time. So without God in His world, man begins a descent into materialism, wickedness that ultimately destroys him. Before this would happen, God would intervene in order to save and preserve the seed of promise. Remember what I'm saying? The bottom line here of the, of the Genesis story is how is that seed of promise you know, preserved from one generation to another? So now he's saying this is a bad time, things are falling apart, how is God going to preserve that seed? And so we read in uh, chapter six, verse seven, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. So this intention is articulated here in verse seven, and the extent of God's judgment is expressed. All would perish except the marine life. Everything else is going to, uh, is going to perish. And, and I, I, wanna, I want you to understand, you know, Satan's tactics, right? He has a lot of different tactics. He's always working. And one of his tactics within society is to remove the name and the worship and the presence and the authority of God in every place where it exists. And so in our country, and I'm not going to go off on a, you know, a rant here, but in our country, in Western countries where Christianity was the most powerful idea okay, at one time, is slowly being diminished 
you know, it's being dismantled piece by piece by various groups and so on and so forth. It's out of the schools, it's out of government. Pretty soon you, know, you can't even say what you want to say. Uh, the, 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 the attitude of society is that uh, everything must be tolerated and so on and so forth. So you know, you're, we're not crazy. You're not crazy if you think, wow, you know, there's a lot of evil in our society. Yeah, there is a lot of evil. And, I, and what really amazes me is when, when the, you know, like that young guy that just killed all those people randomly you know, and then made a video of himself you know, and, and, and now they're playing the video nonstop, days and days, just encouraging some other you know, unfortunate individuals to do the same thing. You know? and, and, and it's when I see uh, news people and, and, and talking heads on cable you know, wring their hands and saying, What's wrong? What's the answer in our society? Why is this happening? Uh, thou shalt not kill. We don't say that anymore. Kids don't memorize that. My little granddaughter, uh, Sophia, you know, she's being taught in, in, at, at school, uh, not at school, but at you know, Bible school. You know, she's being taught to sing the Ten Commandments. You Bible school teachers, you know what I'm talking about? Singing the Ten Commandments? You know, she's what? Uh, oh, now I'm in trouble, I can't remember her age. But anyways, <laughs> she's four, yeah, she's four or five. You know what I'm saying? She's being taught to memorize that. And somebody in the world is going to say, oh, isn't that cute? Yeah, it is cute because she's five and she, you know, she kind of fumbles her way through it. You know? But it's important because what's being done is the commands of God are being sown into her heart from an early age. And so if she ever gets to a point where she's saying to herself, why not? Why not? Why shouldn't I pick up this gun? Or why shouldn't I sleep with that guy? Or why, why not? Her heart will have an answer for that question. Her heart will have an answer for that question because her parents have sown the seeds of God's word in her heart. And that's the trouble with our society. People are saying, why not? And there's no answer to that. So they go ahead and do what they want to do. All okay, right, it's a teaching class, not a preaching class, but. All right, so verse eight. It says, uh, uh, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So this is the final verse in Noah's record and his account. He only writes of himself that he found God's grace and for this reason was spared the judgment. Now in other places we learn several things about Noah. So let's get a little close up and find some stuff out about Noah, shall we? First of all, we find out uh, that he was obedient. Uh, in four different places, in Genesis 6 and 7 and so on and so forth, uh, said that Noah did everything that God had commanded him. He was an obedient person. He had only one wife, Genesis 7, 3, and that may, that's amazing because at that time polygamy was rampant. Um, he was a preacher, 2 Peter 2, 5 talks about that. Now, no one was ever converted by his preaching. He preached for 120 years except three of his sons who came into the ark. He had more children than that, but only three of his children. So sometimes if you wonder, boy, you know, I tried so hard with my kids, you know, I got five kids, only two you know, obeyed the gospel. You know, uh, well, I always tell them, yeah, Jesus had 12 uh, uh, apostles and uh, only 11 of them stuck with him. You know, one dropped out. So, so Noah was a preacher, but uh, he wasn't successful, very successful. He was a man of faith who withstood the pressure of society and discouragement of a failed ministry, but he continued to do God's will. He hung in there. He was a master builder because he constructed the great structure of the ark, and it did survive the flood. And then after the flood, he was the first to offer sacrifice and begin anew the line of those who called upon the Lord. He also became a farmer. We find out about that, he plants a vineyard. Uh, he planted a vineyard, he got drunk on the wine. Oh man, I could preach on that a long time. People say, wow, he got drunk on the wine. How, why did he do that? Yeah, how would you like the whole world to be destroyed around you? And everything killed around you. And then you get off the boat a year later and everything's dead around you and you're stuck on the boat with your wife for a year. Just think about that. <laughs> they, didn't say anything about, they didn't say anything about Mrs. Noah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the, the, all kidding aside, the reason that they put this in there, I think, the spirit, to show us that Noah was just a man. He was just a person. He, was just, he wasn't uh, some sort of superman, he wasn't an angel. He was just a man and he was probably pretty discouraged. 
and what people do at times when they're discouraged, instead of going to God, they find other things to comfort themselves, whether it be music or drugs or booze or sex or whatever. It just shows us that Noah was just a man with ordinary human weaknesses. And he was considered a righteous man by God, not, not just and perfect, walked with God. Doesn't mean he was without error or imperfection. We saw that just before. It means that his heart was turned to God and God offered this man his grace and became uh, and because of grace and mercy, he was considered fully acceptable to God. And as a matter of fact, it's the first time the idea of grace is mentioned in the Bible and demonstrated in a person. Noah wasn't perfect, but he was found righteous nevertheless. That's why I think that we skip over that verse you know, where he got drunk on the wine. You know, that, that's only a way of saying, this is not a perfect guy. And yet, the Bible says, but he was a righteous guy. Remember what I said? Uh, my sermon on Sunday night, I said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I am a husband, I'm not a perfect husband, but I'm a faithful one. So I'm a Christian, I'm not a perfect Christian, but I am a faithful one, okay? Um, and then in verse 9, 10, got to move a little quickly here, it says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, there begins the account of the sons of Noah, and so they begin by uh, kind of tying their record to the previous one. In other words, these words here are words written by Noah's son. Okay? They take over the narrative at this point. Verses 11 to 13, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy them on the earth. So this is another summary statement about the condition of the world. 120 years previously, Noah preached about the conditions, and now his sons are recounting how the conditions had not changed despite the preaching. There's also a mention that the earth would be destroyed along with all men. So the point is that the same people say that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, these people that say, oh, it was only a local flood and, and, and they, did, they just blew it up into a worldwide flood. But the Bible says that the entire earth was covered and this statement is confirmed by the New Testament writers as well, 2 Peter 3, 6, for example. The problem is easily settled with the thought that if God can create the universe, it's a very small matter for Him to cover one single planet with water. Not a big deal. So let me just uh, kind of, give me another three minutes here, let me finish out. So Noah completes his testimony by linking together the 10 patriarchs from Adam to himself. He describes the state of the world as it has been dominated by wicked people somehow produced through Satan's influence. We're not sure exactly how, but we know Satan's been working here. He refers to himself only as one who finds grace in God's eyes, nothing about his work, nothing about his perseverance. He notes that God establishes a specific period of time when he will take judgment on the earth, and then his sons pick up the narrative and they confirm that the world has ignored the warning and they begin to describe the results of God's judgment. We're going to leave off there and pick up next time with the flood. So let me give you a couple of lessons here. Lesson number one, perseverance, not perfection. God knows that uh, we can't be perfect, we can't be without fault, we can't you know, be sinless, but He doesn't even ask us. He doesn't ask us this because it's impossible. He does look for us to offer what we can do and what is humanly possible despite our weakness, and that is that we keep on keeping on. That's what he asks us. Noah persevered in his belief and that perseverance was expressed in cooperation with God to do His will. He built the boat. And I'm not saying there weren't some days when he was saying this boat, this blankety blank boat, man, I'm getting fed up with this boat. But he built it anyways, just like we say sometimes, you know, you know Christianity is pretty hard, you know but I'm not quitting. Like Peter said, you know, Jesus said to the, are you guys going to quit too? And Peter said, well, Lord, where are we going to go? I have that feeling sometimes, you know. Lord, we're, we're, there's nowhere to go. This is the best offer we've got. 
Lesson number two, we don't have 120 years. <laughs> they had 120 years, we don't have 120 years. Imagine knowing that judgment would be in exactly 120 years for today. You know, we don't know when the judgment is coming. It could be today, it could be in 120 years, it could be 120 centuries. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know when Jesus will judge us. And as a minister, boy, that, I'm reminded of that all the time. You people that work in the medical field or whatever, public security, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know, my, my, my best story on this is an immigrant who lived in Montreal who was waiting for his visa to stay in Canada so he could go to a medical school. He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. Finally, he gets a, a notification that his visa has finally come through, it's in the mail, you know what I'm saying? And he can get his visa, which will allow him to go to medical school and stay in Canada. I don't know what country he was from, but he'll be able to stay in Canada. So he leaves his house, and in the mailbox was like a community mailbox, they had a, you know, a bunch of them down the street. He's walking down the street, and a helicopter lost power and fell on him and killed him in the middle of the day. I mean, it's tragic for him, but you, you know what I'm trying to say? You don't know. A little blood vessel pops in your brain, see ya. So we don't have 120 years, we just have today. And the question I'm always asking myself before I go to bed, am I good? Am I all right, Lord? And then last lesson, God can punish us now. Some people say, well, you know, He'll punish me when I, later, maybe I'll go to hell, maybe I won't, but God can punish us now. A lot of times when your life is spinning out of control, sometimes you need to ask yourself, Am I misbehaving? Is there something I need to change? It's always a good question to ask. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.